colleagues could have chairs and not uh, fill up the fire exiting steps. So there's some up here. There's some up there. Oh, there's one. There's a few. There's a few. I know it doesn't work in all cases, but. Thank you. So. It's a um, particularly important lectureship to me because I had the pleasure of knowing Van Doren Hooker, who endowed this professorship. He was the campus architect for many years, and in fact, um, his wife, Marjorie Mead Hooker, and he went to UT Austin and started one of those very early modern furniture stores in the early 50s, you know, the furniture that uh, we all covet now and pay large amounts of money for. They started one of those in Austin when they were architecture students together. And of course, as he said, immediately went broke, right? So um, he was a wonderful guy. He loved architecture. His whole family loved architecture. His children are all engaged in architecture and design. And Marjorie was one of the first women licensed in New Mexico as well, something that he was very, very proud of. And so he felt that it seemed only appropriate that he endow a lecture that focused on architecture and women in architecture in, at UNM, at the School of Architecture and Planning. And so it was very sweet when he did this. It meant a lot to us, and it always allows us to bring in a very, very good architect, and John will tell you about the architect that we have now, whose practice is in Los Angeles, and has been there for a while, and they've established themselves and grown into an amazing design practice, which is no wonder, actually, when you look at the principal partners. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to John. So I have the pleasure of um, having met Angie a few times, not really closely, we haven't spent a lot of time together, but we have been involved in similar committees and similar organizations, and my heart, and for those of you here in the school who know something about me, know that I care about affordable housing, and I particularly like it when it's well-designed affordable housing. So this is something that uh, Brooks and Scarpa does. Um, the, the partnership includes actually three partners. Angie, who is here with us tonight. Uh, we also, there are two other partners, Larry Scarba, who will be joining um, the 603 studio later this semester and participating in reviews with them. And then uh, Jeff Huber is gonna be here as well and doing reviews with the 603 uh, students. 
So, but I'm here to introduce Angie, because they're not here, you're here. <laughs> so, she's the managing principal of Brooks and Scarpa. Um, she's FAIA and supervises all the uh, office operations. And I love this sentence here in this, in this bio. She acts as the office central hub directing project flow and tempo through an ex uh, exacting operations approach she describes with the, with the phrase, accuracy, neatness, and concentration. I love that. So that's, <laughs> she sets a high standard, it's great. Um, she is recognized as a leader uh, nationally and internationally in uh, the field of environmental and sustainable design and construction. She has pioneered more holistic ways of delivering affordable housing, sustainable architecture, and advances in social equity. She's been practicing since 1991 and is responsible for firm development in the area of housing and policy, leading the firm's sustainable initiatives and overall management. Um, this is the last thing I'm going to say here because I like this, this little phrase here too. She's a powerful advocate for the rich, multivalent impact of good design. Ms. Brooks sees architecture as an instrument for the triple bottom line and the delivery vehicle for space that encourages occupants to flourish. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to try to speak without a microphone, if that's okay. Um, do I need to turn this off? I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay? All right. Um, and maybe... Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I want to thank the College of Architecture and the Marjorie Mead um, Hooker Foundation. Um, Marjorie actually started her firm one year after I was born. Um, and um, I'm sharing this professorship with my two partners. And I'm going to talk today about design and housing that's affordable, um, which, me, which is defined as not spending more than 30% of your income on rent. And that currently is a metric that's out of reach for over 50% of the population in major metropolitan areas. Um, our firm does a lot of different things, a lot of different building types. Um, museums, schools, we touch a lot of building types, but I'm going to concentrate on housing. We've also recently opened a Florida office, office that has three people, and that is run by our partner Jeff Huber, and he's also going to be here along with Larry Scarpa um, to uh, help in the studio. So I'm going to show some of our Florida work uh, towards the end of my talk. We also just published a book on our work, uh, which is outside, and it's really a story about architecture. Each chapter is different stories from different parts of different projects that we've done, uh, woven together in chapters that are really centered on what we believe in. And this presentation is also a story. It sort of follows um, the sort of history of our office. And I think there's a clarity when you look back. So I'm starting with the year 2000 when California's electricity was deregulated, which caused statewide brownouts. Um, overnight, our electricity prices doubled, and we became experts overnight. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start this little film clip. It's nearly 100% independent from the power grid. It was built by an architect who specialized. A new building that is energy conscious is now going up in Santa Monica. Getting a lot of attention, Channel 4 is packed with there. At first, there appears to be any new apartment project, just other buildings noisily being put up on a Santa Monica corner lawn. The Colorado Forks. One of Leo's personal uh, passions is finding out ways to provide environmentally safe housing to low income families. Take a look. We're standing here at the first green affordable housing project in the country. This is Larry Scarp of the Architect. Why don't you? So overnight we became experts. A week before the three news channels came to our job site, people were wondering why we were even putting solar panels on the building. Um, energy prices doubled, and then everyone wanted to come talk to us. <laughs> so the excitement was this project. Uh, we call it Colorado Court, and it was designed to be energy neutral. It was designed in the late 1900s, uh, or late 1990s, to have both solar panels and a micro turbine um, to work in combination to make it energy neutral in the city of Santa Monica. 
and the city of Santa Monica called itself a sustainable city in 1994, which was a long time ago. Um, they created a sustainable city plan in 2003 around guiding principles for future growth and they use this as a demonstration project to help them formulate these goals. So the design um, incorporates passive uh, goals, it's designed to catch breezes, the alley collects rainwater from the block, it basically did everything you can think of in a passive building and then it also added the two active systems. It was 44 small studio apartments for people with extremely low incomes and when we talk about affordable housing, some people don't know exactly what that means, but affordable housing is defined um, as area median income. And this project was for extremely low incomes, which means the income level was zero to 30% of area median income, which means you make between zero and $22,000 a year to live here. Um, the design is basically three fingers, three volumes connected by exterior walkways. When you design passively, you guys know you have to use very thin floor plates. Um, each unit gets natural light and ventilation from both sides. And there are only 375 square feet each. So all you really need is one small window above your front door and then a window on the opposite side of your unit for cross ventilation. And what was really innovative back then is now mandatory in the state of California. Our codes actually require us to design net zero residential buildings by 2020 and net zero commercial buildings by 2030. And it's coming up pretty quickly. So for us, solar panel is having solar panels, either community solar or solar on your building is really the only way we're gonna get there to these net zero energy buildings. But buildings of this type generally suffer from a lack of really nice materials. So um, we're always fighting against budgets. And for us, the solar panels gave this project sort of a, sen a sense of dignity. They added um, a really nice material that normally you wouldn't get. Um, during the course of construction on this project, we actually had to get state legislation changed to allow projects of this type to be built. Um, and you'll see on some of the slides of our projects, I actually have the tag for the density of the project, which is housing units per acre. And that allows uh, me to kind of visually show you what the density looks like. And density can be beautiful. There's a link between density and livability. For this project, the structure and materials were very simple and inexpensive. And we always try to do more than one thing with our materials. Um, the walkways actually shade the southern side of the building. The stair structure holds the solar panels. The roof water actually drains through the stair structure. And the solar panels also <coughs> shade the walkway, um, but also let filtered sunlight through them. There's no need for air conditioning in this building, and there's very little heat. There's very little space for the car, um, not required here. Uh, it's right near light rail in Santa Monica and bus stops. And for us, solar panel makes a lot of sense. I think probably here it makes a lot of sense as well. In LA, it's sunny only about 360 days of the year. So I'm not sure why not everyone is doing it. And this is a picture that we took outside of our old office um, out the back door. We had no idea what was going on, but we knew that he was probably operating a power tool or something back here. But the solar panel was the power for the power tool or whatever was happening behind that door. <laughs> And we also know that uh, in this country, when people talk about solar panel, we sometimes, not so much now, but 20 years ago, people used to say, oh, solar is just so expensive. Why are you guys doing that? Well, solar is not expensive if you have no energy grid, which is why you'll see it in third world countries. Um, this one's being used to transport refrigerated medicine in the desert. So for me, it's sort of all relative, but uh, the cost of solar has gone way down. Um, for this building, it gave sort of a sense of richness that we wouldn't get with projects of this type. And this building was finished 18 years ago at a cost of $142 a square foot. But um, even with all the great things that are embodied in this building, uh, we really feel like it still doesn't address the street well enough. Um, the ground floor is essentially a blank wall or a fence because the zoning in this area does not require pedestrian use on the ground floor it should really have a better connection to the street. So similar uh, to these buildings, which I define as sort of fortresses, 
um, that do not activate or support street life at all, we started to think, how can we educate developers of this type of housing to make better buildings, um, and in particular affordable housing? We realized that we had to meet them early to talk about design principles, and we had to advocate for better public policy and zoning. And this is an image from the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, which is a nonprofit that uh, runs a program through Enterprise Community Partners. And it was founded by three people who are architects, uh, Larry Scarpa, my partner, Katie Swenson, who works for Enterprise, and Maurice Cox. Um, it's it's uh, based on the Mayor's Institute of City Design, if any of you have been a part of that. And developers meet with the design team to work through <coughs> issues, and then they go back to actually finish their projects, and they're affordable housing developers. The um, summit occurs every year, and every year report is provided on the projects. I think it's been going on for about five or six years, and a lot of developers have said the experience has really helped them make better buildings. Developers essentially get, over the course of one or two days, a mini PhD in how to design well. And um, after a few years, uh, they started to develop a toolkit uh, for developers. And the program is growing every year. And last year, it won the National Collaborative Achievement Award from the AIA. Um, and unfortunately, this is from 2004, but unfortunately, more and more people cannot afford housing. <laughs> used to be if you worked you could get ahead but now we have a term called the working poor and we know that housing is getting more and more out of reach for everyone we also know that population is increasing and particularly in la our housing is not keeping up with the need and this is a um, statistic that was published i think about 10 years ago which predicted that the negative vacancy rate was going to be huge and what we've discovered is that our negative vacancy rate in Los Angeles is now starting to correspond with our homelessness problem. So good density is needed. These are planning charrettes that we held to visualize good neighborhood density to explain to politicians and developers and policymakers how to actually make good density. Um, because the people in Los Angeles hate two things when you go to community meetings. They hate sprawl and they hate density. <laughs> so to address these issues, we founded a nonprofit called Livable Places, which, uh, whose purpose was to change policy and develop examples of smart growth because we found that there was a lack of leadership on the policy side. So we wrote ordinances for the City of LA Planning Department to use as templates and they actually asked us to write them and then actually just implemented exactly what we wrote. Um, so they adopted several of them, but this one was the townhome ordinance, which allows people to build row houses, fee simple houses, no side yard, you could own your own home, but you don't have to be a part of an HOA. And it was illegal before we wrote this ordinance. Ten years after the ordinance was adopted, the city of LA started to have a conversation about it. The ordinance helped the city increase housing stock at a better price point than single family. And our point was really that we need options uh, between a single family house and an apartment building. We need a series of options. Um, this article is interesting, wondering if we're destroying um, affordable housing because our purpose was to increase affordability. You take a lot that had one house on it and you put five houses on it, you're gonna increase affordability and give people more options. Now the city is actually changing the ordinance, uh, but ironically not because of affordability. They're changing the ordinance because it became political and the NIMBYs in Los Angeles pushed back because they didn't like the density or scale. So they're actually scaling back the ordinance. And we have something that, uh, a certain type of person in LA that we call a banana, not a NIMBY, it's a banana, and it means build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> so that's what we're working with. Uh, this is an example, this is another architect that used a small home ordinance on a lot, five houses where one used to exist. This is another example, um, they're ba it's basically an alternative to the single family house, but it's five times denser. We did this one called Orange Grove in the city of West Hollywood. It's five units. 
where one house used to exist. All the parking is provided in one semi-subterranean level. They're townhouse units, which have shared party walls. Um, the front facade is designed to sort of bring the scale of the building down. You can't really tell this is five houses from the, from the front. You enter your units from the side yard. And the interiors are two-story sort of light-filled lofts. We use really inexpensive materials, large, you know, glazed garage doors that you could just open. This is another one that we designed that used to have a single family home on it, surrounded by apartment buildings. So five homes where one used to exist. <clears throat> and this is Los Angeles, which we do have a transit system and we do have a bus system. Um, but it's very disconnected in some neighborhoods. So we studied how to better connect disparate neighborhoods and particularly the Lincoln Height area with parks, bike, and walking paths. And one of the areas we studied was just outside of downtown LA where Livable Places purchased this building. It was the old Fuller Paint Company building and it was mostly empty in an industrial zone near the Gold Line, which was our new light rail. Um, it was illegal to build housing here, but with political support, we designed an adaptive reuse complex. We added two floors to the roof of the existing building and created 102 condominium units with a mixture of uses and income levels. The yellow building is the existing building and those held the affordable units and then the top two floors were market rate. We essentially took the building and cut a donut hole in the middle of it to let light and air into all the units. Um, and when we, ra we wrapped the two floors with a screen to, um, there are amazing views from, from the roof of this building. You see the mountains, you can see downtown LA. But it took us one entire year to get approval to build what I consider to be a smart project because we had to get 25 planning variances. Because 25 things we did were not allowed on this site. Things like parking, um, high, the building was actually in the highway dedication, but of course we're not going to tear the building down. But land, land is really inexpensive here, and it's perfect for housing. It's near a school, a park, and light rail. And it was really a symbol for the rebirth of this neighborhood. I also believe to create beautiful, sustainable buildings, um, Building codes need to change. The bottom really needs to come up. And California has been a leader in implementing really strong codes that I think have had real effect in the last, last few years. And I thank our, we call him the governator. I liked him as, a ter as the terminator. But I also think he did, um, he did something that's really amazing. When Arnold Schwarzenegger was our governor, he implemented AB 32, which is, the state of California's long-term approach to addressing climate change in California. We've always had Title 24, which is our energy code, and it's the main reason California's per capita electrical use has remained flat over the last 40 years, while the rest of the country's use has continued to rise. But we knew that that wasn't enough. So um, Schwarzenegger signed a bill which would cut greenhouse gas emissions 25% by 2020 to combat global warming. We recently discovered that California actually met those targets in 2016, which is four years ahead of schedule. So we now have something called SB 32, which is our state requirement that more than doubles the current rate of reducing emissions by 2030. So we're on track, uh, but it takes political will at the state level. But when we design buildings, our design always stems from the climate of the region where the building exists. I went to the University of Florida and my partner did as well and they used to um, tell us it was something called regionalism. People didn't actually call it sustainability back then, but it was something that architects had to do um, just as a matter of course. This project is called Rosa Gardens and it's in the desert of Palm Springs. It's 57 units for families and it was designed passively. So it's in a desert climate, it's sunny, dry and hot, the average temperature is 75 degrees. So we designed a building with large overhangs because shade is really important here. Over the last 15 years, we've worked with several nonprofit clients and I think they're actually the most forward thinking and innovative because they're the ones who actually have to own these buildings for the next 70 years. 
the buildings um, of this project are organized around courtyards and you can see that all the parking is on the perimeter. There's absolutely no parking in the middle of the project, which leaves a lot of open space for people and not cars. And some of the tools that we use to bring the scale of the building down um, was to treat the entire facade as one canvas rather than 20 separate apartments. This is a two-story building, but it's actually considered a large project for this area. <laughs> kind of like some of the areas in Albuquerque that I see, very low scale. Um, we use long, we use balconies, long balconies and material changes to articulate the facade. June through September in Palm Springs, the average high temperature is above 100 degrees. So um, large overhangs and shade canopies do more than one thing. They actually shade you while you're circulating uh, between the buildings and they also provide gathering spaces for people. This is the main courtyard and this project was done for $76 a square foot. The colors of the building come from the landscape. And we use, on all of our affordable housing projects, they have tight, tight budgets. So we use low cost materials, a variety of materials, and we use them in kind of beautiful ways. Stucco, metal panels, cement board. Um, for this project, you leave your car on the perimeter and circulate through different kinds of public spaces to get to your front door. We really wanted to kind of separate cars from the people. In 2010, almost 15% of Americans were living below the poverty line. So in California, there are multiple nonprofits that are solely dedicated to housing and providing services to, to the homeless. This project is called Step Up on Second. Uh, the owner is um, one of those developers who builds only housing for people who've been previously homeless. And these are studio apartments in Santa Monica for people with mental disabilities. And if you notice the density um, on this one, it's almost as high as Manhattan. And that's in a five-story building, type five, five-story building. The building performs very well passively. The fins on the front of the building diffuse early morning light and the four-story screen that's on the side that's south facing actually provides this dappled light into the courtyards and we didn't realize that it would actually decrease the energy load by 10%, but that's what it does. It was really a design feature that we then realized shaded the building enough to reduce our energy load. The front facade is created from water jet cut aluminum panels, so we spend um, most of the money in one place, and particularly this was in the front of the project, and it's something that we do on a lot of our projects and we call it mass customization, and you basically do something once and then you repeat it in a pattern. So these are um, water jet cut panels that are all the same pattern. They were stacked up once and cut once so that they were sort of very cost effective and then they were anodized different colors and then they were placed in a pattern that was both beautiful and performative so they don't actually look the same. It gives you the appearance of a complex pattern. <clears throat> and it was done on an, on an existing empty parking lot. The last three buildings we've done in LA have been buildings on parking lots. It's a mixed-use project. The building sits ab above the lobby in an art gallery. And we believe in something that we call design equity, which means that access to good design should be a basic civil right regardless of your income level. So we always have a, a portfolio of affordable housing projects in our studio at any time. The diagram is three boxes that are connected by um, exterior walkways. And this is an example where policy and reality didn't really align for us. We had to provide parking for 22 cars in a subterranean garage at the cost of almost $400 a square foot for people who do not have cars. <laughs> the units are super tiny, they're 240 square feet each. Um, for some people coming off the sidewalk and moving into a 240 square foot apartment unit, it's a big, big deal. One of the tenants here slept on the floor for an entire year before he could sleep in his bed. Um, but we always put little transom windows above the doors and then a window opposite so that it pulls the air through the unit no matter what size it is. And then we put Murphy beds in the wall that flip down um, when needed to either be a couch or a bed. 
And then to um, encourage socialization, there are two large common rooms, large kitchens for cooking on um, different floors. Everyone circulates on the walkways around the courtyards and we always tuck the elevator away and make the stairs a feature to encourage people to use the stairs. We spend a lot of time designing what are required exit stairs because then no one can sort of cut that out of the budget. And these are the two uh, large kind of community rooms that look out into the main courtyard and the four-story screen. The building is basically a letter E in plan. You'll find that if you design narrow floor plates, your buildings start to look like letters. <laughs> That's how we used to design buildings 100 years ago. Um, this is another project in Santa Monica on a sloping urban site, 200 feet long. And the challenge for us was how to transition from a 12-story hotel to a two-story building at the other side of our property. Our height limit was 35 feet. Um, so we wanted to create some kind of street wall because this is Pico Boulevard in downtown Santa Monica, if you know it. It's a very busy urban boulevard. But we also wanted to provide some open space and privacy for the families that live here. So we pushed the volume to the side yard setbacks and then created this frame that became a threshold to enter a private courtyard. Um, as you move through the frame, you enter this kind of secondary courtyard. Um, the density is a little bit lower than the other projects I showed because the units are much larger. These are three, two and three bedroom family apartments. And then we covered the courtyard with a shade fabric um, so that the people who were in the hotel had something nice to see as they looked over our building um, onto the sort of sea beyond. Um, but most of our projects are designed around courtyards, you know, so courtyard housing has been around for a long time and there's a reason why that topology really works. We use inexpensive materials, there's no air conditioning in this project. But the site slopes 10 feet from one side to the other, um, so we sort of split the difference for the main courtyard. Um, and we provide a sort of openings through the building volumes to allow light and ventilation into the courtyard. And then we've done this little trick in a couple projects, which is that if you only have one level of subterranean parking, you can actually open up that level and then plant trees in your lower level and they actually grow up through your courtyard. Um, it makes the courtyard really invite, it doesn't cost any extra money, and then it makes your courtyard just really nice inviting space and it encourages people to actually use the stair and the elevator is tucked back behind. And this is the community room with the green roof, just typical sliders that slide and allow the community room to open to the courtyard. In a few areas we used accent paint, but um, in all the other areas the material is no maintenance at all. The color is actually integral, so there's no paint needed except where you see a little bit of accent paint. And then the neighbors in the back wanted the building to look as good in the back as it was in the front. So we tried to do that for them. And this is the interior of one of the units. Each unit has cross ventilation, um, no AC, and we did this for $168 a square foot. And this achieved lead platinum also. So in, in Los Angeles, homelessness has increased 75% in the last six years. And um, I think we've been the homeless capital of the country for a while, but it's in the last few years it's gotten really worse um, locally. So the next two projects I'm going to show you are for people who have been previously homeless. This is in Venice, California. And in Venice, California, you'll find some of the smallest lots anywhere in the country. This uh, parcel was two lots that were tied together. The total lot size is 80 feet by 116 feet. It's a four-story building, 21 one-bedroom units, and it was conceived and planned very simply with two bars with an open space between them. The courtyard is on the second floor and a little driveway and a tiny uh, parking garage tucked in the back of the site. And the site was so small that all of our required open space had to go on the roof wow. next to the solar panels. Um, but a lot of people think uh, that building buildings to house people who are homeless actually cost too much money. 
But we know that leaving a homeless person on the street costs the city of Los Angeles an average of $35,000 a year in medical, emergency, mental health services, and law enforcement. And incarcerating that person costs the city $46,000 a year per person. So an investment of $10,000 can help that same person obtain housing, food, job training, and support services. So we know that it's actually cheaper for the city to house people and provide support than it is to live people, leave people outside. Oh. Sorry. Let me get back to where I was. Um, this might be because I have another video embedded in my presentation. <clears throat> hmm, this has never happened to me before. Not sure what the problem is. Maybe I should restart. If we watch the movie and then just jump ahead. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the clip right there in the in that folder. Let me see. It wasn't actually right at that spot. It was. Um, I'm just going to skip it, maybe. I skipped the offending image. <laughs> it was an image of homeless people. Sorry, I don't know. Okay. So, in Los Angeles, we've discovered we can't build it fast and cheap enough. Um, the people in LA voted for two bond measures last year, which um, are increasing the amount of money that the city of LA is providing for what they call permanent supportive housing. So, housing for homeless people that also have the support services embedded in them. And this project is being used as an example that's part of the solution. It's for homeless veterans and it's called the SIX. We know in Los Angeles that almost 10% of our veterans, uh, well, almost 10% of our homeless population are veterans. So this project specifically wanted to help those people. Um, the design is really essentially a courtyard building like all the buildings that we try to do. It's designed to be passive. Um, the open space is on the second floor courtyard and on the roof, and there's solar on the roof. And I put on the screen our predicted energy use intensity. I don't know how many of you know that um, energy use intensity is really sort of tracking how much energy you predict your building's going to use. After you're done and the building's in operation for a year, you go back out and you look and you figure out what your EUI really is, so your actual energy use intensity. And the idea is to actually start getting those numbers really down. So our predicted um, energy use intensity is 48, which is 40% better than a typical apartment building of this type, and that's before we count the PV. So when the PV panels are on the roof, that should be much better. And we're verifying all of that with a post-occupancy study. But it takes about a year. After the project's built, we go back out and, and study how it's been working for a year. It's for the Skid Row Housing Trust. It's the first project they've done off of Skid Row. Um, Skid Row is a place which has the largest concentration of homeless in the nation in Los Angeles. And this neighborhood was a neighborhood of large apartment buildings, so um, we sort of fit right in, even though we're a little bit larger than our neighbors. 
It's 52 studio units and one bedroom units really organized around this podium courtyard which sits over the entry, computer lab, and support services, and then parking for some cars and bikes. Uh, the rec room has a large sliding door, so that opens onto the courtyard, and the stepped planter in the front of the building um, was meant to really sort of connect the building to the street. Uh, we had um, meetings with their building committee, and their building committee is made up of people who were previously homeless, we thought they wanted sort of a grand stair in the front of their project which physically connected them to the street. And after meeting with them, we realized that they wanted to be physically separate from the street but visually connected. So we changed the design of the front of the building to do that. The density is 153 units per acre, which is still pretty high. Um, but all the units have cross ventilation. And we treated the building sort of as a study and scale. Um, rather than a solid and uh, defensive looking front with a lot of tiny punched windows, we spent a lot of time looking at the front of the building and how it would look, appear on the street and we wanted you to actually see the open space, the courtyard. Um, so we spanned the fifth floor with the <coughs> units. So the scale of what is actually the tallest building on the block is actually appears smaller and is a lot more open. This is the kitchen, living room, rec room on the second floor. The art was provided um, pro bono by a local art gallery and by framing the courtyard with the portion of the building on the fifth floor um, we were able to make it appear a little bit less defensive more inviting but when you're sitting in the courtyard you actually feel like you're protected from the street and the project had to be 35 percent better than the average building on the energy side and the only way we can get there is to design a building passively to begin with um, which reduces the mechanical load of the building and then add a little bit of solar or hot water um, solar panels. Most people walk to this building, so we wanted a strong connection um, through the design to the street. This is the entry, the little computer lab on the right hand side. And then some of the open spaces on the roof and we used these, we created these sculptural forms which actually hide the kitchen exhaust as it goes up through the roof and it subdivides the roof into smaller spaces. The tenants have um, edible gardens on the roof and there's amazing views of downtown LA. But there's really a direct correlation between ceiling height, height of your window, and amount of natural light that gets in the space. These are two tenants on the right hand side that were featured in the AIA's Look Up Film Challenge. I think it was last year or the year before it actually won. So I'm gonna play a clip of that for you. We've become a culture that ignores people and looks the other way. Our homeless problem, especially in Los Angeles, is so large now that it's almost untenable. There's a lot of suffering that goes on. If you're not ready to live in the streets, it gets pretty profound. I've known Mike for a long time, and this is really our first uh, collaboration. The name of this project is The Six. Uh, in military terms, it means I've got your back. And really, Mike is the six for homeless people. I think I was one of the first people who, who, who had keys, and I thought, I, I thought I was dreaming. And I came to look, and it was empty. I was like, who talks is this? They said, yours. A radio, a microwave, a crop box. A good design is not what something looks like, but what it is like meaning how you experience it. Breaking stereotypes of the homeless comes back to design. It says something. It says we care about you. Uh, good design is part of the healing. A little bit like Frank Sinatra. If you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Whatever we make here, whatever buildings we build here, they're part of the larger fabric that defines our cities. And that last speaker was Michael Maltzen. He's uh, finished a building just recently for Skid Row Housing Trust. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the stuff that we have on the boards now, which um, aren't designed, but aren't built yet, but are under design. This is the original flower market in downtown Los Angeles, which was founded by the Japanese growers in the 30s. Um, it's still a wholesale flower market today, and they actually own almost the entire city block. 
It's only a two-story building, um, but anyone can get flowers online now, so the wholesale flower industry is actually declining. This is what their existing building looks like. So they want to add 332 units of housing. They want to have restaurants, creative office space, public space, and they really want to create a 24-7 mixed-use apartment building. Um, the design is really meant to honor the flower with this honeycomb pattern on the balconies and the use of a lot of color. And let me see if I can use my pointer. This building is existing and this building is new. Um, this is a public paseo we're creating through here and this is a new 15-story tower in the center, residential tower. There are gardens on all of the roofs. We're creating an event space on top of the parking, a level of subterranean parking. 10% of the units are going to be set aside for workforce housing in this project. Um, and when we design bigger uh, buildings such as this, we look for ways to really create complexity through simple means. And so for this project, which we anticipate will be concrete slabs, we are going to shape the edge of the slab in different ways, um, five or so patterns. And then those patterns are then shifted on every floor. And then the edge of the slab is connected with walls to give you um, what really is sort of a textural look at really no additional cost. This is in an industrial area of Los Angeles where currently it's illegal to build housing. So we've been in what they call an entitlement phase for almost two years now to get approval from the city to build the housing on this parcel. Um, the entry to the residential tower is through here. This is a, the existing building which is gonna be covered with a flower mural where the wholesale market will be. This is the entry to the living tower or residential tower here and this is the new sort of restaurant side with parking and then some townhouse units and a garden up here. And that's looking down into the public paseo. The blocks in Los Angeles are 300 feet, 150 feet by 300 feet, and the uh, zoning code says you're not allowed to have 300 feet of a wall. So you have to have a public paseo where the public can actually pass through the block. Uh, they don't have to walk more than 150 feet uh, by a solid wall. So this is private space that is going to be open for the public. They can close it at night with a gate but then they have to open it during the day and it has to be at least 50% open to the sky. This is a small project we're doing in Venice, California. 35 units for homeless people um, over the nonprofit's headquarters. It's again the same courtyard typology with the front of the building that steps down with planters so that you don't have to look at the guardrail in front of the courtyard. Create sort of a semi-public space. Um, and then we're working in Florida, creating affordable homes for the city of Delray Beach. These are images of the typical suburb that exists there now. And we looked at the block and we tried to investigate the best ways to use available open space um, in what is essentially a suburban kind of uh, land by orienting the homes more inward and creating a tiered set of open space from public to semi-public to private to basically uh, give more spaces for people, less spaces for the car. So these are some of the houses. We're eliminating the fences between the houses. We're using inexpensive materials like cement board to filter the light and provide a bit of privacy on people's patios. <clears throat> And these are all affordable for the city of Delray Beach. And then I'm going to end with some of our work on sea level rise. We're working with the city of Fort Lauderdale um, because most of us know that climate change is already here and cities are already having to deal with the effects of climate change. And we also know that low income communities are at a disadvantage because they have very little ability to bounce back after a disaster. So because of that, it's actually affecting all of us. It's affecting our economy, our way of life, and our ability to really prepare for the future. This is, 
Yeah, an image from the East Coast. Um, cities have been flooding in some areas of the East Coast since 1970. Chronic inundation is, de is defined as flooding that occurs about every other week, which is 26 times per year on more than 10% of your neighborhood's land. And I think New Orleans is the only city that meets that criteria right now. But big cities are starting to invest in studies and programs that um, help them mitigate these issues because the effects of it are already here. This is Boston, Massachusetts, which sees you know, flooding like this periodically. And this is Fort Lauderdale, and they call it sunny day flooding. So the streets actually flood with salt water when it's not raining. When there's a king tide, the water from the sea actually operates in reverse and goes through the storm drain system and floods the streets. And that's a direct result of sea level rise. Before Hurricane Irma in 2017, this is what the city of Fort Lauderdale looked like, and the city just spent a lot of money to build this little seawall here. And then the hurricane came through and dumped one foot of sand on the street. So nature ignored what we just built. <laughs> so this is sort of an example of you know a short-term Band-Aid solution, spending a lot of money and it really not working. Nearly half of the US population actually lives within 50 miles of the coast, including most major commercial, leisure, and import-export businesses. And it's commonly understood among the scientists that talk about this that at one foot of sea level rise, it could impact 20 feet of coastal land inland. 200 feet, sorry, inland. Our partner, Jeff, um, who actually lives in Fort Lauderdale, several years ago started a conversation with others to find solutions for communities that are adapting to this changing environment. And he's also teaching at Florida Atlantic University. And he started this work with his students in his design studio. This is an image from um, some of the uh, teachers, doctors that are there of what would happen to the city of Fort Lauderdale with sea level rise. We're researching uh, what would happen at varying heights of sea level rise, what would happen to the urban landscape. And this is actually the western side of Fort Lauderdale, which is actually lower than uh, the side that actually faces the Atlantic. And you can see that it doesn't take much. With three feet, we'll permanently flood some parts of the city of Fort Lauderdale. So he held workshops, he invited stakeholders, a lot of student work went into this, and then Larry, my partner, also um, had a design studio at USC that worked on these issues. This is a map of Fort Lauderdale as it exists today. The city has always been really linked to water with this interconnected um, canal system. But it's only three feet above sea level, so it's actually the most vulnerable major city in South Florida. Over 50,000 houses and its entire downtown will be uninhabitable by 2100 with six feet of sea level rise if they don't do anything. This is what it's going to look like. Um, and although Miami Beach is also vulnerable, Miami Beach has its assets that are actually out of immediate risk, but not the city of Fort Lauderdale. So uh, we know that you can't just do one thing. You have to do a lot of different things. So we looked at managed retreat, pulling away from the coast, adapting buildings and landforms to the new water level, and then defensive moves like pumps and floodgates. The ecology and the landscaping of the area is gonna change, and so how to deal with that and bring back what was in the area before and learn from how nature used to actually mitigate the rising sea levels naturally. There are plants that actually transpire more waters than other, other plants that could actually help mitigate some of the flooding. <laughs> plants that live in salt water, not just fresh water. So we can develop a set of techniques for adaptation of the coastline, and it's called a soft coastal infrastructure to manage the rising sea. In Florida, there are actually freshwater reserves that are very close to the salt water. And the issue is really to ha how to protect the fresh water from the salt water. So we're trying to undo some of the bad practices from the past. Florida has been overrun by tract housing developers who've actually poured a lot of concrete over everything, which has lowered Florida's water table, the freshwater water table. So from mechanical to biological, 
We have ideas that will replenish the aquifer, naturally clean stormwater, um, and protect the fresh water supplies. And then the most radical scenario is really um, adjusting land and readjusting where you put buildings, where you have density, creating barrier islands, creating new building typologies, obviously new zoning, um, new recreational possibilities, basically in a community that's going to have to celebrate the water in the future. <coughs> And uh, we're really proud of this work, and it won a 2018 National AA Honor Award for Regional and Urban Design, and we call it Salty Urbanism. And it's really a long-term solution that other cities can use to meet the challenge of sea level rise. And it started in the design studio. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering about your sustainable housing projects that you guys look at repair and maintenance as mm -hmm. part of your recovery strategy for the sustainable future of those buildings. Yeah, so the question was do we look at repair and maintenance in the affordable housing projects that we do? And that's a really good question because we, we know that none of the nonprofits that we work with have big maintenance facilities or people who actually do any of the maintenance. So we use materials that don't need to be maintained at all. So if we use concrete, it's natural concrete. If we use stucco, it has an integral pigment in it. So if you see any building of ours that's stucco, that's a color, or even if it's white, it's a pigment. None of it's ever painted. We try to use paint really sparingly. And then if you use paint, you make sure that your paint spec is the best on the planet so that that paint is not gonna ever peel. Um, but we understand that, so we try to make buildings that actually have no maintenance, which, you know, you're going to have a little bit of maintenance at some point, but that's something we look at that we generally don't talk about just because we, we do it. And then even when we have private uh, clients, we do the same thing because I don't think anybody should be spending money and um, operational expenses maintaining their building if they don't need to. How much does uh, seismic mitigation factor into the cost of uh, low income housing? Um, one thing that I've, so the question was how does seismic mitigation uh, affect affordable housing and one thing I've noticed over the last 20 years or so, as our seismic codes have gotten more stringent, uh, we have to use more wood, more plywood, so um, where it used to be when you, because a lot of these are type 5, so the wood frame construction, in the past it would be just a lot of studs and just a few pieces of plywood, now um, all, a lot of the walls are plywood, most of the walls are plywood. So. The only thing that I've noticed is a little bit more plywood, so not really that much for buildings that are um, basically five and six stories. Um, so foundation work doesn't. No, it's really more of a factor of the soil. So if you have, we've um, the project the six that I showed you was on soil that was so bad the entire building had to be built on a mat foundation, which is two feet thick of concrete with 45 foot piles that went into bedrock below it. So your cost is really in the soil. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of construction costs are you seeing in your smaller, higher density projects? Um, it's, it depends on what city you're into. So the Palm Springs one was obviously a lot less expensive than the ones in LA. Um, our nonprofit developers have to pay what they call prevailing wage, so union wages, um, and that increases the hard costs of the affordable housing projects that we do by 30%. So on the project, the six that I showed you, the cost is about $250 a square foot. If I did that same project for a private developer, it would have cost less. So we find that um, building actually affordable housing, there are so many codes on size of units and storage space and stuff. We spend more money, probably 30 to 40% more money on the hard cost of the affordable housing projects than we do on market rate projects. Did you start your um, collaboration with the nonprofit communities? Did you seek it out or did they seek you out? Was it more of a natural progression? Um, so the non so I, when I graduated from SciArc in 1991, I didn't want to work in a traditional um, <coughs> office. I wanted to learn about development. So I um, went to the nonprofit, the only nonprofit in Los Angeles that had architects and developers on staff. 
and they weren't hiring at the time, but that was where I really wanted to work. So coincidentally, someone was working there who I had known from school, and she told me that she was leaving in a couple weeks. So I went in and learned the computer system at night, and then when she left, they hired me. They said, oh, okay, we'll hire her so that they didn't have to go out and interview anybody else, I don't know. So that's how I got my job, working at a nonprofit, and I spent three or, three or four years there, and I learned a lot about development, and I met a lot of the nonprofit executive directors of a lot of the nonprofits. So I've always um, kept them as friends of mine as well, and when we founded Livable Places, um, they actually were on the board of Livable Places. So they've always been friends um, of ours. We've um, in the past, it's taken time for them to hire us to do work. Now I find that they're my repeat clients. So there's three nonprofits that actually work, we work with, and they just call us up and say, we're ready for you to do this project with us. You know, we don't have to interview for them at all. Um, but it's taken 15 years, yeah, to get to that point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a lot of really good work here. Um, you mentioned the number of, of uh, legal barriers to getting doing these kind of affordable housing projects. I was wondering, what, what do you think is the, the single most important policy change that could be made to make this stuff easier? Um, zoning. So I think the single most important change to make projects easier is zoning. And that's on both the private side and, you know, private market rate, nonprofit, I don't care who you are. In Los Angeles, our zoning code is um, from the 40s, the 1940s. So everything you do in LA, pretty much everything, is an entitlement, which means you need discretionary approval. So what we need are buy right projects. We need to be able to go into a community which already knows what the future of the built environment is going to look like, and then we just sort of fill it in. What we don't need is what we have now, which is we want to build five stories here. We have to go through 10 community meetings. We have to get approval from the neighborhood council, which is next week. I have to get approval for the one I showed you in Venice. The land use and planning committee of the neighborhood council, then the neighborhood council, then the planning commission of the city, then the city council member. So it's a, it's a Byzantine process in the city. And I think the single most important thing that would get more of these built um, is zoning and our mayor has said you know the homelessness problem is a crisis and he doesn't know how to do it how to you know make it better and I continually say when I talk to people it's zoning it's zoning it's zoning you know and everyone's like oh that's gonna cost a lot of money it's gonna be 10 million dollars to redo our zoning and we're already started at Angie you know but I've lived in LA for almost 30 years and it's been zoning for the last 30 years so I know that cities can do it and I know it doesn't need to take 30 years, it's just political will. So we have a political system which is not a strong mayor. The mayor's voice is the same as all the city council members. And the city council members have about 100,000 people under them, their neighborhood. So they're like kind of mini mayors, so to speak. So they really like the fact that you have to go ask them to build in their communities. So they like to keep the status quo the way it is. It's a political, it's really just political will. That's my opinion. <laughs> so on the donut project, you had, you had said that you had 25 variances to mm -hmm. get through. When you learned of that challenge, were, were you guys disheartened or were you invigorated? <laughs> yeah, so the question was on the Fuller Lofts project, the yellow existing building that we put a donut hole in the middle of, were we disheartened when we realized we had to go through 25 variances to get it built? And the answer is we didn't because we came at it, it was through the nonprofit that we started, and we wanted to use it as an example. So the idea, the city council member was actually supportive of it, and he said, what I want to do is change the zoning of my neighborhood. So he wanted to show people what it took to get it done, and then change the zoning of his neighborhood to make it like a mixed use, high. he wanted high rises all over the place, housing and everything. But the length of time it took to get that project done, you know, he termed out, and then there was a new council member, and then zoning never changed, you know. So, so it's uh, it's taken way more time than I thought when I started practicing 15 years ago doing these types of projects. It's taken a lot longer to actually get the policy part of it to change. So any, if any of you have any interest at all in becoming politicians or policy makers, I would encourage you to go to LA. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
or stay here. <laughs> because we need help. I mean. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of like the uh, Skid Row project, how do you have uh, a building that also involves community integration so that it doesn't become like an isolated oasis? How You mean how do we <coughs> connect with the community? Right. Mm -hmm. So depending on the client, it's done different ways. Some clients, um, well, most of the nonprofit clients that we have have their own supporters, and so they will have community meetings, and their supporters will also come to the meeting. Because what happens 100% of the time when you build affordable housing is that people come to the meetings not wanting poor people to live in their neighborhood. And I don't care what income level the neighborhood is, no one wants affordable housing in their neighborhood uh, because of the type of people who live there. So some of the nonprofit clients that we um, work with use design as a political tool. They actually say we only hire good designers because we don't want the discussion to be about the design because that's what people can say, oh, I don't like that building, it's ugly. If they can say, I love the building, it's beautiful, then they don't really have another argument. They can't say, I don't want poor people in my neighborhood. You know, they <laughs> don't have anything else to talk about. So, um, so we try to get the community on board who are really the people who are going to either live there or the supporters of the nonprofit, you know, as well as the other voices. But um, in a discretionary approval, if one voice says, I don't want this bill, or if anyone sues you or appeals the approval of the planning commission, then your project's dead. So it allows any voice to stop a project for any reason, um, the discretionary process. You mentioned that your permit like helps with uh, some state level mm -hmm. loss. Um, are you? Did you have a take on SB twenty seven? Are you like helping uh, with whatever its successors? Can be? Was... Um, uh, so I'm also chair of the AIA's committee on the environment this year. So at the national level, I'm actually working on federal policy at the um, national level with the AIA. Um, but for that project, Colorado Court in Santa Monica. We actually didn't know we would need state approval. We just started the project and we had um, the utility company in our design meetings and everyone said, this is gonna be great. Just put a meter on your solar system and put a meter on your micro turbine and everything will be fine. And then we started construction and the utility company, which was Edison, a private utility company, said, oh, I'm sorry, um, you can't uh, do that. You can't have a net meter with your solar because you have a micro turbine. And it turns out the micro turbine was considered a dirty energy source. And the code said, Edison's uh, 300 pages of code says that you're only allowed to have solar or wind on a project that gets a net meter. And the only reason the project would financially make sense is to have a net meter. Otherwise, you're giving the utility company all your power for free. So we had to get state legislation changed to allow three different things. The uh, size of the system, at the time, um, the state of California only allowed 10 kilowatt size solar systems to be net metered, which was something that Edison actually got them to do because Edison um, said that anything larger than that would be a, a health uh, safety issue. But a 10 kilowatt solar system is like a large single family house. So it didn't really make any sense. So that legislation was changed and it was through the public works uh, department of the city of Santa Monica. So um, he was really our advocate, and Sheila Kuehl, who was our state assembly speaker at the time, was behind this project too. And so it was politicians who were already there, who knew what we were doing, who were able to get it through. And everyone was so worried because the lobbyists for Edison uh, you know, flew to Sacramento to tell everybody how, what a disaster it would be if they let us do this project. Um, they said, okay, well, we're going to change the net metering law to allow projects of this size to be net metered, but we're only going to do it for three years, and then we're going to sunset it after three years if something bad happens. So nothing bad happened, <laughs> obviously. So, but it takes that leadership to get something done. Um, you've discussed a lot of like, the housing pro projects that were um, nonprofit. Have you found that such projects could be profitable as a incentive to want to develop this way as an incentive or do you think that that would be kind of a 
conflict, would that cause other kinds of abuse or something like yeah. that? Maybe I'm looking too far ahead. There are some private developers who do, um, like Forest City, for instance, is a private developer, and they do an 80-20. They do 80-20 deals because they actually think that um, they think it's a bad thing for communities to have affordable housing all in one building or all in one neighborhood. It's better to d disperse it throughout communities. So when they build projects, and their projects are very large, 20% of their projects are affordable and 80% are market rate. And so that's an 80-20 deal that they do, and they're a private company that makes a lot of money. So I've always said, if they can do it, then what are all these other developers crying about? <laughs> but, you know, um, I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's financially infeasible. Okay. But you haven't had any of those clients here? Oh yeah, we've worked with Forest City and we've worked with private developers. The city of LA actually um, requires private developers to have a certain percentage of affordable units in their projects. It's just that I don't think we're going to meet the needs with just that. Yeah. Maybe one last. Talk a little bit about some of the funding sources you have for these projects. Yeah, so most of the projects I showed were non-profit clients, um, and their funding sources generally range. They never have just one. So the state of California has what's called a tax credit allocation committee, and some people call it corporate welfare because it's corporations who can um, not pay all their taxes by giving money through this system. So that's some of the money. Um, there's the Enterprise Community Foundation. There are foundations that provide money. Uh, the county of LA provides money, sometimes the city provides money, but generally it's four or five different funding sources and they all have their different rules and regulations and they all have different sustainability requirements because everybody wants to have sustainability, which is good, but they all have different requirements. So it becomes the architect's responsibility to do a big matrix spreadsheet of all of the requirements and then pick the most restrictive one and filter it to the top. So I've gone to um, nonprofit annual conferences to tell everybody that if you could just doesn't make the building any better at the end of the day you know everybody get on the same page and just say we want it to be at whatever it is and then we can do that for you but just don't everybody have different rules you know thank you um, okay. just a reminder that their book is available outside <laughs> <laughs>